Our speaker today, David Farland, is an alum of the University of Illinois and is a community member who really has a passion for helping uh, others and you know grow and impact their businesses. And so um, we enjoy bringing new voices into our community um, and who, especially those who really want to help our company. So we're really looking forward to what. Dave has to say in his presentation today is very intentional about putting his contact info up there. So if you want to, write that down now. Um, but also, I'm guessing that it might be on a later slide, too. So um, and if you don't remember that or don't write it down and want to get connected, we have his information as well. So happy to connect you um, as needed. So without further ado, please give a warm Enterprise Works welcome to Dave McFarland. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you, everyone, for showing up today. Um, I hope I don't get these too confused. I didn't practice with the microphone. So the last time I had one of these in my hand, I had a lot of hair to throw around. So it's been a while. Um, as Laura said, my name is Dave McFarland. I'm local, right? So I live in Champaign. So yeah, I do like to help uh, local businesses succeed. So if you think there's something that I can help you with, uh, please reach out uh, after the talk. So today, my talk is called Paradigm Shift. Dramatic operational improvement starts with a change in mindset. And uh, this is the way it's uh, going to go today. I always start with objectives. And these are my personal objectives, right? So every time I give a talk, uh, there's something that I want to do, something I want to convey. And I, and I like to share that with you, what, what the goal is in my talk. And we're going to talk about change in general. We're going to define mindset and paradigm shift. We're going to talk a little bit about a fixed versus a growth mindset. And then we're going to get into changing mindsets, challenging assumptions. I'm going to introduce you to a couple of change models that you might want to use. And then we'll summarize a little bit. And then I'm going to end with a call to action. So my objectives today are first to con convey to you that change is. Right? It, it just is. Uh, mindset drives change. Mindset affects change. And mindset, methods, and measures interact. And those are important when you're going through a change process. And I'm also going to try to provide some immediately actionable content. Right? So every time I speak, I like to give you a little tool that you can take away that doesn't take a lot of practice, doesn't take a lot of knowledge, but can be powerful. And so I'm going to leave you with a couple of those today. And then I'm also going to try to spark action. Right? So I wouldn't be here talking about change with you if I didn't think I wanted you to go do something. So at the end, I'll try to spark a little action. So change in general is a challenge, right? So sometimes it might be goal-oriented, so you want to stop a bad habit, start a good habit, or maybe it's an objective that you want to meet. All of those things uh, pro propose a little bit of a challenge. And if you're the person that the change is directed at, it can be a threat. Right? And that creates a challenge as well. So if you go in and you tell people, well, I know you've done this, done it this way forever, but we're going to change it. You're going to start doing it this way. People might start to think, well, does that mean they're getting rid of me? Right? Do they not want me anymore? So they can perceive that as a threat. The other thing that they might feel threatened about is something that they like to do or, or a freedom that they have in their job. If you're changing it, they see that as a threat as well. And then there's resistance. So generally speaking, people can resist change, right? Sometimes they'll just refuse to cooperate outright. Or they might be a little more passive aggressive and say, yeah, this sounds great. And then they revert back to the old way. Or sometimes it's just flat out sabotage, right? Someone's actively working against you to prevent the change from happening, right? So there's a lot of challenges to change in general. But uh, change is the only constant in life, right? So this concept has been around for a long time. Right? Heraclitus was a Greek philosopher, right? So it's been around for a long time. So I'm going to make a little confession here. I always use quotes in my talks, right? I like to pull things in that help make my point from uh, other people that you'll recognize from outside, or, you know, other big thinkers. And uh, I found a lot related to change, a lot of quotes, and uh, I had a lot of trouble <laughs> trimming down that list. So I'm going to share a few of these with you that I think 
uh, might resonate with you or that you might want to use on your own. So that's the first one. This one is from Dr. Deming, and he was a, uh, a management and a quality guru for the last century. A little bit of a curmudgeon, so some of his comments are a little sarcastic, but he said it's not necessary to change. Survival is not mandatory, right? Interpret, change, or die, right? That's what he thought about it. George Bernard Shaw said, progress is impossible without change. And those who cannot change their minds cannot change anything, right? <coughs> Alfred North Whitehead said, the art of progress is to preserve order amid change and to preserve change amid order. I like this quote so much that it was in my signature in my email for years, right? This is basically the definition of continual improvement, right? You have to always be changing to get better, but you can't let things fall apart in the process. And then uh, Ben Franklin seems to have a quote about everything. <laughs> so I pulled one of his out, always a little pithy. He said, when you're finished changing, you're finished, right? So change is important. So this is what I mean by change is, right? Change is a constant. It's inevitable. It's necessary for survival. And it's the key to improvement. So I'm going to ask you now, what are you willing to change? Right? I want you to think about this through the rest of the talk. What are you willing to change? And you notice I didn't say, what do you need to change? That's a different argument altogether. You want to start with what you're willing to change, because that's something that you can accomplish. If you have something that needs to change and you're not willing to, then that would be a whole other talk. So we're just going to stick with this. So think about this throughout the talk. The quotes keep coming. And I like this one from Stephen Covey. He's the author of uh, you know, Seven Habits. He said, if you want small changes in your life, work on your attitude. But if you want big and primary changes, work on your paradigm. And that's what we're talking about today. We're talking about working on your paradigm. So in the title, I talk about paradigm shift. What do I mean by that? Well, paradigm shift is a fundamental change in approach or underlying assumption. Right? So if you want to change your paradigm, you got to work on two things. You have to challenge current assumptions, and you have to change your mindset. And there's a little bit of a chicken and egg thing going on here, right? So you might think, well, which do I do first? Do I challenge assumptions and get it into mindset? Do I change my mindset so I can challenge my assumptions? I'd say it doesn't matter. Whatever you think works. Whichever way you can attack it and get the change you want, that's the way you do it. For the sake of the talk, I'm going to start with change in mindset. So before, before we start changing mindset, let's define it. So I like this definition of mindset. A habitual or characteristic mental attitude that determines how you interpret and respond to actions. Right? So I, I folded the tasty bits. So mental attitude, right? So your mindset is basically kind of how you think. And it drives your attitude. And then it also interpret respond is important, right? So mindset, when it says how you interpret, means it's it's a filter or maybe a framing mechanism, right? And then that's going to lead how to how you respond, right? So mindset drives attitude, which drives behavior, which leads to actions. So mindset is really important. Uh, Alan Weiss is probably the world's most famous consultant. And he, had said, he said this about mindset. What you think informs your behavior and it's manifest in your actions, right? So everything begins with mindset. That's why it's so important. So I talked just a couple minutes ago about challenges with change. And there are additional challenges when you come to changing mindset. And some similarities, right? So first of all, change of mindset can happen whether, whether they're directed or not, right? It's going to be based on your experiences, what you see, what you hear, who you listen to. So it's better to direct that a little bit, right? To help people walk to the mindset that you need. Mindset affects personal behaviors, which in turn affects your company culture, right? Your company culture is basically just a collection of behaviors. And so that mindset is linked to all of that. So changing mindset can be hard because you tend to challenge long-term beliefs, right? It might mean that you have to admit you're wrong, 
or even worse, if I have to admit that someone else is right. And it can make you question your past decisions, right? So if you've had a mindset for a long time and you've made a lot of decisions based on that mindset, it's kind of difficult to change, right? We don't like that. It's uncomfortable. It's, it's difficult. So uh, I like this from Mary Shell, and she said, nothing is so painful to the human mind as a great and sudden change, right? We just don't like it. So what do we do about it? How do you change it? The first thing you have to consider is that uh, in her, her really great book, Mindset, Carol Dweck said there's really just two mind made mindsets, growth and fixed, right? So you can equate this with being open-minded or closed-minded, right? And that kind of overarching view uh, impacts everything else. And I mostly agree with that, but I will add that there's also many mindsets, right? So you notice that in the header I have mindsets with a big M and mindsets with a little M. So the growth and fix are kind of the big M mindsets. And then you have all these little mini mindsets. And the mini mindsets are more based on your current beliefs, right? And they can be subsets or drivers to that big mindset. And most of these are malleable or fluid, situational. So an example is if you have a lawful mindset, which I, you know, most people do, right? But if I get out on the interstate and drive toward uh, Chicago, I notice that there are a few people that uh, don't take that speed limit seriously, right? So it's a little bit situational there. Um, Trugality is another one. I, I know people that will buy the absolute cheapest toilet paper when they go to the store, right? And so when they're spending on their cells, they're very frugal. But when they buy a gift, they're not. Punctuality is another one. So I might say, I'm very punctual. I'm on time to work every day, but then I'm late to the dentist every day. Right? So it's situational. And then some of these mini mindsets can also be permanent or semi permanent. So think about things like uh, religion and faith, politics and prejudices. Those are a little more ingrained. It's not impossible to change, right? So you'll hear about people uh, changing their religion, maybe when they get married or something. And uh, every once in a while you'll see a politician that jumps to another party. It can happen. Uh, prejudices are hard to give up, but you know, it happens. People have an experience and changes, right? So a lot, a lot of things going on with mindset. Another thing that, that Dweck said in the book was that we're all born with a growth mindset. Right? So my little diagram here shows growth mindset at the beginning and then as time goes to the right. And, and I agree with that, right? So if you think about it, when you're an infant, you can't have a fixed mindset because you don't have anything to fix on, right? You haven't learned anything. You, you haven't been biased at all, right? So everybody starts with a growth mindset. But as you age a little bit, in the formative years, those many mindsets come into play and they kind of act on that big mindset, right? So they can either reinforce a growth mindset or they can flip you to a fixed mindset, depending you know, on your life experiences. I further argue over time that pyramid at the top gets weightier and this thing kind of flips over. And this is what I said at the beginning about mindset being a filter. So when you, age, when you get, you know, a little bit older, certainly when you get my age, your growth or fixed mindset is kind of settled in. And now that's going to impact, it's going to educate all those little mindsets, and any new mindset that might come across, you're going to approach it with either that growth or fixed filter, right? So changing mindsets can be difficult, especially if you're trying to change someone from a fixed to a growth, right? If you go right after that, that's going to be hard. But what you can do is you can, you know, look at that patchwork at the top, and you can pick one of those mini mindsets to work on. And maybe you can get one of those a little bit more of a growth bias. And then over time, maybe that can trickle down and, and give more of a growth mindset overall. At least I hope so, because that's what we want. We want people to have more of a growth mindset in general. So if you have a fixed mindset, you're going to be anchored to the past. You're going to look at your last success, viewpoint, the way the process, the way that you did it, right? You live in the past. And so everything in the past is the answer and you don't look forward. 
You're reluctant to admit you don't know, and you're reluctant to ask for help. Alternatively, if you have a growth mindset, instead of being anchored to the past, you're optimistic about the future, right? You, you're, you're more flexible. You make database decisions. And uh, you're persistent. You're willing to make mistakes, but only if you can learn from them. And then you believe that trying trumps talent. That's really important, right? It's not just about the talent that makes you succeed, it's the trying. So bottom line is, don't waste time looking backward if you want to move forward. So some behaviors that would come from that. So if you have a fixed mindset, you're always seeking to justify and entrench your current position. If you have a growth mindset, you're actually seeking to understand current reality. If you have a fixed mindset, you're always looking for evidence to validate your current thinking or strategy. If you have a growth mindset, it's just the opposite. You're trying to look for information to invalidate your strategy. Effectively, that's the scientific method, right? You have a theory, you do some experiments to try to disprove your theory. If it doesn't disprove your theory, good. My theory is still valid. If it does disprove my theory, I adjust and come up with a new, new theory, right? You have to have a growth mindset to do that. When you make a mistake, right, something goes wrong, in a fixed mindset, you look for someone to blame. When something goes wrong, if you have a growth mindset, you see that as an opportunity, and you look to enlist someone to help you. Fixed mindset, I failed, I'm not good enough, I give up. Growth mindset, I failed, I'm not good enough yet. That little word makes a big difference, right? You're just looking for something. Say, yeah, okay, I failed, but uh, there's something to learn there and I'll do better next time. The same with I don't know, right? Fixed mindset. I don't know means I'm not smart enough. With a growth mindset, I don't know means I need to learn this and who can I ask for help. And this is something uh, from my personal experience. You know, when I was in high school, I was a smart kid. And so most things came easy to me. And so when I ran up against something that I couldn't get right away, I said, well, I guess I hit my limit. I'm not smart enough and I gave up. I did that a lot. I don't do that anymore, right? So now, I actually actively look for things that I don't know so that I can learn them. And that's the growth mindset. So the challenge then is moving from that fix to growth, right? And here's a little tool you can use to do that. And you can use this on yourself or you can uh, encourage other people to do this. And basically, you just ask three, yourself three questions and you answer none. So every time you fail or you have, a, you know, run into a blockage, you ask these three questions and answer no. The first question is, is this permanent? Right? So my example here is, let's say I'm writing a, a chapter in a book and I'm really struggling today, right? So a fixed mindset would say, is this permanent? Yes, I lost my ability to write. I give no. A growth mindset would search a little bit for a no and say, no. I'm just exhausted because you know I was up late last night on that conversation with China. Right? So not permanent. The next question you ask is, is this pervasive? So let's say you're having trouble at work. A fixed mindset would say, yes, this, this is pervasive, everybody hates me. A growth mindset would say, no, I just have a bad relationship with that one guy at sales, and what can I do about it? The third question is, is this personal? So the example here is, let's say you're a consultant, you're trying to get a customer to sign a contract and they say no, right? A fixed mindset would say, yep, it's personal, I didn't get the contract because I blew the presentation. A growth mindset would say, well, the presentation wasn't great, I admit that, and I'll, and I'll do better next time, but I just don't think she was ready to sign, there's something else going on that I don't understand, right? So three questions, is this permanent, is this pervasive, is this personal? So answering no to those allows you to frame all setbacks as temporary, specific, and external, right? That helps you maintain your growth mindset. So you basically say, I'm going to learn from my mistake and get back to work. And you're going to make changes to make sure it doesn't happen again. All right, that's, that's my spiel on mindset. So let's switch gears here and talk about challenging assumptions.
I'm going to teach you another little tool here that you can use. And it's based on sufficiency logic, also called cause-effect logic. Everybody knows this. This is those if-then statements, right? And the way this tool works is you construct this. You have to write it down, make it very clear, and then read it. So it's not that you can't do this in your head. You just do it better if you write it down. And I was really skeptical about this when I first started doing this, but it really does work better. And the other reason to do this is if, if you write it down and you make this construct, uh, you can use it in a group setting. Right? You can kind of uh, bring it into your brainstorm. So the way this works is you write down the cause in a box and you draw an arrow up to the effect. Right? So that shows you the direction. Right? So this is basically a simple if-then statement cause and effect. But so, so you can look at this on its own and check the validity of it. Does that make sense? If I do this, will I get that? The other thing that you want to do, and this is a real powerful part, is you want to look for that hidden assumption. Right? We often make these uh, cause and effect leaps or if-then statements where there's more to the story that we're not telling. And that might be where the, the issue really is, and that might be the leverage you need flip the mindset. So when you write these out like this, you can read it like this. If cause and assumption, then effect. Right? And you read it out loud just that way. So effectively, the assumption out to the side becomes another factor that you need to get the effect. Right? So here's an example from my life. Right? Um, let's say I want a, an oak tree in my backyard. So I say, if I plant an acorn at spot X, then an oak tree will grow at spot X. Well, you don't know what I know about my backyard, so an assumption that I'm making is that the squirrels are growing the acorn. I have a lot of squirrels, right? So that may not be a valid assumption. And this happens all the time, that, that people make these constructs, and then when you pull out those assumptions, you find, well, if that really has to be necessary for this to happen, I don't think it's going to happen because that assumption's invalid, right? And that's why this is useful to help flip the script, change the mindset, change your paradigm. So I'm going to give you some uh, examples from my world. So when I work with companies, a paradigm that I see often is what I'll call optimize everything and strive for efficiency everywhere, right? So you want everything everywhere to be perfect. And so if I want to put that into a cost-effect statement, it might look something like this. If all resources are fully utilized and operated at 100% efficiency, then the system output is maximized. Right? On its face, this sounds perfectly logical, and a lot of people operate this way. But there is a hidden assumption. And that hidden assumption is that the sum of these lo local optimizations result in a global optimization. Now, when you're challenging an assumption, you can't just show them this little grid here and say, see, you're wrong, <laughs> right? You, you gotta back this up a little bit. You can't just tell them that's invalid. You can't say, I don't believe you. You gotta bring more to the party, okay? So what I would use in, in a situation like this is this little graphic in the boats. I love this graphic. So what you see is you got two boats. So the boats represent systems. And the people rowing in the boat are the processes in the system. All right? So what you see in the first boat, I'm sorry, I can't point. Um, the first boat, you got four people rowing. And each one has one oar. And so the oar is indicative of the amount of effort. The other thing you'll notice in the top boat is the angle of the oar. They're all the same, right? So the processes within the system are providing the same equal effort, and they're synchronized. And what does that do? It gets your boat going straight across the finish line quickly. So think about what's going on in the second boat. Right? It's basically it's the same system, same boat. We've got four people rowing, but now management got involved and said, I don't like our efficiency numbers. Right? We need to improve the output of the individual processes. And so they do a little contest maybe and say, oh, we're going to do some uh, process improvement, right? And everybody, each group, you have to improve your process. You have to give me more output. And so the guy in the front of the boat is the winner, right? 
he tripled his output. The guy behind him, well, he, he gets beat on the head because he didn't change his output from before. And then the last two do pretty well because they doubled their output, right? Because so everybody's happy, great success on this process improvement. But what happened? They broke the system, right? So everybody's process improved, but the system is performing poorly. In fact, this boat's never going to reach the finish line, right? It's just going to go in circles. So the thing that to understand in this case is that a system is never the sum of its parts. It's the product of the interaction, right? So it's called systems thinking for a reason, right? If you if you optimize every process, you don't get the best system. And so to summarize on this, the, the uh, assumption that I challenged was that the sum of local optimization is local optimization. And what I want to do is I want to change mindset and go to a new paradigm of global optimization instead of local optimization. Right? And so in that case, we're going to focus on the total output of the system instead of the individual parts. We're going to say effectiveness trumps efficiency. And we're going to say some resources need to actually underperform to maximize system performance. Right? That's a pretty dramatic paradigm shift from what there was before. right? So that's why I said you can't just challenge it you have to bring more to the party. Uh, here's another one, another example. This is something I see often. The start as early as possible paradigm, right? And so you can map this out like this. If I start the job, project, or task as early as possible, there's a better chance of completing on time, right? That's why we do it. Why, why are we starting early? Oh, this is coming up. We better get an early start on it, because then that way we won't be late. There's a hidden assumption here, too. And that is increasing the number of jobs, projects, or tasks in process at the same time creates no delays, right? We're trying to get ahead. We're trying to do things faster. So we're assuming that by doing this, we're not going to create delays. And so I would challenge this assumption, right? And the way I would do that is I would introduce it to something called Little's Law. Little's Law is a mathematical theorem that was formulated to basically calculate how long it takes you when you're standing in line. It's really simple. But it can actually be used in a manufacturing environment when you're building something. And with, if you do that, then the variables, L means work in process, the units of work in process. W equals the lead or the wait time, how long does it take to get things done? And then gamma is the arrival rate, right? So when you have an equation like this, right, let's say we hold arrival rate steady. So we only put things in at a constant rate. Well, that means that L and W are not directly proportional. If one goes up, the other goes up. One goes down, the other one goes down, right? But what that means is that if we add more units of whip, our lead time is longer, right? And what are we doing if we're starting as early as possible? We're adding more things into the system, right? If you do that, you're not going to get done faster. You're going to get done later. So the challenge is this assumption. Increasing the number of jobs, projects, or tasks in the process at the same time creates no delays. But we're going to challenge that, and we're going to, instead of start as early as possible paradigm, we're going to switch to start only as necessary paradigm. Right? So again, this is paradoxical to most people. Start later and finish sooner. But if you're flooding your system, that's exactly right. We'll tell people to remember Little's Law, and the other thing this helps you is to limit task switching, right? If you have a bunch of tasks that you have to do, you're jumping around from all of them back and forth all the time, that's a great time waster. And so that will also make you late. All right, so that's how I would use that tool to challenge assumptions. And you can do it exactly the same way um, in, in your place of work. But it takes, it takes uh, more than just a change of mindset to create this paradigm shift, right? You have to have a method, right? So when people undergo big changes, they usually use some type of plan or model, right? So there are change models that you can use. And so I'm going to introduce you to two of them. The first one I call the three M models, mindset, methods, and measures, right? So mindset is basically how you think about the task, right? And so questions you might want to ask is, does everyone think about it the same way? And if not, why not? Another question you might ask is, does it matter? There are some cases where it doesn't matter, right? So if that person 
won't change their mindset. Don't beat your head against the wall if it really doesn't matter to, to the change of project. And the methods are basically the way we complete the task. And there's only two ways. There's the way it's supposed to be done, and there's the way it is being done. And so you need to keep an eye on that and, and, and somehow measure it. And then traditional, traditional change management would measure um, the progress on the task by looking at the outputs, the effort, the activity, the cost. And I'm going to tell you not to do that, right? If you want to do this type of paradigm shift, and check on progress and mindset. You want to measure the way they behave. Okay? In, in two measures, you want to measure compliance and focus. And by compliance, I mean, are they doing it the way it was designed? Right? And how often are they doing that? So you can actually get the frequency of how often they're doing it the way that you told them to do it. And if they're not, you want to know why. Right? So get those reasons for non-compliance and, and try to correct it. And then the other one I talked about earlier is it's very common when you do a change like this is that you get reversion to the old methods. So you want to keep an eye on that as too. So you're measuring their behavior. And the other thing you want to measure is focus. Focus means to me, this is taken from uh, something called theory constraints. Focus is doing what should be done and not doing what should not be done. And the second part of that is harder to get them to do <laughs> What's probably more important? So I'll give you an example. I was visiting a company that did a, a plastic injection molding, making a medical device. And when I visited the line, I watched the machine working, and they had these really big, uh, large gauge needles that they would put in with a robot, and then the plastic would form around it, right? And so when I was watching the process, I noticed there are all these needles at the bottom of the tray. And so I asked the line leader, I said, you know, what's the deal with all these needles? Did you just leave them there or do you, you know, collect them and reuse them? And he said, no, 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 we don't reuse them. Um, we just, you know, eventually we'll clean them out and discard them, recycle them or whatever. And I said, oh. And he goes, yeah, yeah, we, we've just decided it's too dangerous to mess with them, right? Because in the machine, a robot's handling them. We don't want people to handle those needles. We're afraid someone's going to get injured. And plus, I'm making a medical device and I want blood all over my product, right? So I said, okay, I'll, I'll buy that. So I went over and talked to the operator, who was about five feet away, and he was working at a bench. And I walked up to him and I noticed he had this big bucket. So I looked in the bucket, and what was in the bucket? A bunch of those needles. And he, while I stood there watching him, he reached in and was grabbing needles and loading them in the cassettes that the lead leader had just told me only the robot does. Right? So the operator thought he was doing something good for the company. Right? He thought he was saving them money by reusing these needles. But it's exactly the opposite of the way that they designed the system. Right? So you have to make sure that people focus to do what they're supposed to do and not do what they're not supposed to do. So this is the way the 3M model works. It's kind of a flywheel. Right? So you would start with mindset. Right? You want to establish a mindset. Mindset is going to drive attitudes, okay? And then methods. You have to design the methods to get the results you want. And then the measurement, as I said, is you're measuring behaviors, right? We, we already have the results. We know what those are. But the measures of behavior are going to tell you why you're getting those results. And that's important. So leadership is responsible for the mindset portion, right? So they're responsible for creating and communicating the mindset, just like you would in a mission vision statement, right? You have to uh, communicate it. And then management is responsible for defining and communicating the processes that align with the desired mindset. And then they're also re responsible for reporting results. And then the individuals in the system are responsible for executing the processes as we're communicating to them through training. And reinforcement of the behaviors is through the measures of compliance and focus, as I said. And you don't get it right the first time, most, most of the time, right? That's why it's a wheel. You might have to keep adjusting. So another change model that you'll see, this seems to be a pretty popular one, it's called Cotter's Change Model. And it has eight steps. I'm not going to go into the gory details here. What I want to tell you, though, is that if you're doing something related to mindset and paradigm shift, you want to use that 3M model regardless, right? 
So if you're going to employ something like this, what I would suggest is to overlay the other model with it. And it's very simple to do, right? So in this case, you know, mindset's going to overlay those four steps. Mindset methods would be part of five. Methods would be six. And then the last two steps would be kind of a mix of methods and measures, right? And you can do this with any change management system you want or any plan you make. You can always put in the mindset methods and measures. So a little bit of a recap on mindset and change, right? If you can't adopt and embrace a growth mindset, change is unlikely to happen and persist. And that's true of you as an individual, and it's true of an organization, right? Um, what's the buzzword used to be about? Uh, learning organizations, right? It's very similar to having a learning organization, growth mindset. Um, measures of behavior. It's harder to remove an old measure than it is to add a new one. What do I mean by that? So I gave the example earlier about uh, efficiencies, right? So if you've been measuring efficiency um, for a long time, and that's what people are used to, and you tell them, we're not going to measure efficiency anymore. We're just going to measure system output instead. Um, they're going to have trouble getting up on the efficiency measure. First of all, they're not going to believe you because the bonus was tied to it for so long, right? So they're going to continue to do things to pump up their efficiency numbers, even if you don't tell them to. So, so you have to watch out for that. And then you need to over-communicate your vision, mindset, whatever it is. You know, don't have CEO syndrome. Right? CEO syndrome is, I said it, so it happens. Right? You need to go out there and check. So a few more quotes here. Why do we change? We want to get better, right? So if you don't, if you always do what you've always done, you always get what you always got. You ever heard a, a rendition of that? So a lot, evidently this has been attributed to a lot of people, but my sources tell me that Jesse Potter was the one that initiated it. And then uh, Einstein said, said, we can't solve problems by using the same kind of thinking we used when we created them, right? We have to do something different, right? I go to so many places that uh, continuing improvement is just to do it faster than we were doing before or more of it. And what you really need is something different. Um, regarding that, I got Diving on here again. He said knowledge necessary for improvement comes from outside. And I found this to be very true. I used to work in an organization. Whenever something like this came out, we wanted to implement something or change something, there was basically one mind that would come up with the idea and everybody would jump behind them. Right? You don't want that. You want, you want to pull something from outside if you want to do something truly different. So to summarize, change is, right? You have to embrace change. You have to want it. You have to direct it to go the way you want. Mindset drives attitude, behavior, action, and results. So you really can't ignore it. You have to get in the right mindset. And meaningful change, as the title said, requires a paradigm shift and begins with a change in mindset. So I'll encourage you to adopt and enforce a growth mindset Remember the three questions and answer no. <clears throat> Challenge assumptions. And at the end, when you get to implement implementation, you do need a plan, right? Work model. And I encourage you to incorporate mindset methods and measures in that plan. And lastly, do something different, not more of the same. Otherwise, you're not really going to get a paradigm shift. So I said I would end with, with a, a way to spark action or call to action. And so these are four questions that I'm going to challenge you to take back to your place of work and get answers to these and see if it can help you spark change. The first is to ask, what is it working? Sorry, I shrugged. I got away from you. What, ask, what is it working? Right, that's where it starts. Right, you don't want to change something that is working. What needs to be changed and what are you willing to change? Right? At the beginning, I asked you to worry about what you're willing to change. Well, now I'm going to say, you also ask what needs to be changed. And then from that list, pick what you're willing to change and work on those first and save the, the needs for another day that you can go after later. And then ask, what are you going to change to? Right? You don't go in and just change things without a plan. You need to know what you want to change to. Otherwise, it may be worse than what you started with. And then the last question you want to ask is, 
how are we going to do this? How are we going to implement the change, right? Who do I need? What resources? What, what plan am I going to use, right? So map it out. And that's the way uh, that you're going to get paradigm shifts and dramatic change through the mindset path and then following these processes. Thank you very much. I will take any questions you might have. If you have a question, if you're shy and you don't want to ask a question in front of everybody, I, I'm not in a hurry to leave, so if you want to come back and talk to me afterwards, that would be fun. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing all these important uh, lessons. <laughs> uh, no, because uh, uh, when you mentioned the mindset, that is the growth mindset and the fix. Uh, so, it's, you mentioned as we grow less young, <laughs> so uh, we are more fixed. But is the, this growth and uh, fixed mindset, it really depends on age, uh, or it could be a 20 years old guy that have a real growth mindset? So, so let me uh, uh, clarify something if I said it wrong. When, I probably did use the word fixed in the wrong way. So I didn't mean that as you grow older you get a fixed mindset. I mean you fix on either a growth or a fixed mindset, right? So you tend to, as you get older, um, you'll either have your growth mindset reinforced and that's the way you are for the rest of your life, or you'll have a fixed mindset that becomes the an anchor and that's pretty much the way you are the rest of your life. That, that's what I meant. So I didn't mean that everybody changes from growth to fixed, but somewhere down the line, they kind of gravitate toward one or the other, and then that becomes the filter. Is, it, is that clear? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I, I know, uh, may I know. So I know many things that you present or uh, things. Uh, you, you, you recall to me uh, in several aspects of what you call uh, emotional intelligence. Mm -hmm. Like uh, it is like an emotion. So emotional intelligence. Uh, that the uh, growth mindset is to to uh, exercise our emotional emotional intelligence. Well, I would say I, I've, I've read some books. I've, I've read several books on emotional intelligence, and I will tell you what's in that book would be hard to accept and implement if you didn't have a growth mindset, right? Because it's challenging a lot of the things that, that you would normally do, right? And so, uh, yeah, emotional intelligence definitely has some aspects that really speak to having a growth mindset, right? So, you know, active listening and things like that, right? So active listening means you're really hearing what people are saying and you're not judging them as they're saying it. That's a growth mindset, absolutely. Yeah. Is that anything about being I would say that depends on who you talk to, right? So I guess I have a fixed mindset about having a growth mindset. <laughs> so, so yeah, uh, in, in her book, uh, Dr. Dweck said that it's really hard for anyone to be one or the other, right? So you tend to have a bias toward one way or the other, but you could probably pick things out, those mini mindsets where you'd say, well, that mini mindset really has a growth aspect to it, or this one has a fixed mindset to it, right? So uh, one example I gave was religion, right? So as, as you get older, it's going to be harder to change that, right? So people tend to get that to be very fixed, right? But they might have a growth mindset in every other aspect of their life, right? So it really is hard to say that any person is one or the other. It's really a patchwork. So thanks, Dave. Um, it's a wonderful presentation. Um, you brought up the term learning the organization. Yeah. And so I'm curious if you have any like, historical perspective of, I'm sure there was a point in time where somebody said, oh, I think we should start learning, or I think we should start paradigm shifting. But I'm wondering if there's a historical uh, reference that you may have about what maybe urged those organizations to say you want to move in that. You know, I'm kind of valid in my mind this ideal of 
maybe the pros and cons to being a non-learning organization versus being a learning organization. Kind of where is the blend and crossover between the two? So in my experience, I've seen learning organizations try to be adopted in two contexts. One is a big old organization that's failing, and they say, we got to catch up. we got to do something different. I'll give you an example of one that didn't do that, Blockbuster. Right? They definitely weren't. They had a fixed mindset. They weren't willing to learn. They just said, we're just going to keep doing what success you know, looked like in the past. Just keep doing it. There's no reason to change. Right? Um, a different example would be Microsoft. Right? So Bill Gates, early on, thought the internet was key. The internet stuff, we don't need to get involved in that. He pivoted. Right? So he became, you know, he, he, had a little, he had a fixed mindset at first, and he, he pivoted and said, you know what, this is something we need to get on top of, right? Did they become a full-on learning organization? I don't have uh, the intelligence, the inside intelligence to say if that's true. Um, but uh, I would say at least early on, Google was very much a learning organization. Now that they're big and bloated, who knows if it's quite that, that good. Um, and then the other time that I've seen it try is very small organizations, right? So very small organizations, it's usually easier to get, you know, 5, 10, 20 people on the same page and say we're going to do this than it is to get tens of thousands. So as far as, um, um, I, I would say I'm a pragmatist. I think there are probably pluses and minuses to absolutely everything, right? So if you look at some of the minuses to a learning organization. One thing I will tell you is uh, I've been to companies where they did some change and they lost a lot of people, right? So they, they lost some of their skills because those people weren't willing to adapt, right? And, and that was a negative at that time. Um, will it be a long-term positive? I, I think so, right? Because eventually those people were going to kind of drag them down anyway. So like all things, I, I think it's hard to say that this is 100% yes, this is 100% no, there's probably a little bit of a balance. Yeah. Good question, thank you. Thank you, very interesting topic. I'll stand up and try to go and sit down. Um, I think fixed and growth mindset work like in hand in hand rather than like one or the other. Um, and also like, you kind of interchangeably, like you grow and then fix into that and kind of like, um, any thoughts you have on that? Well, well, personally, I think for a lot of people that works very well, right? Again, I'll, I'll say the religion thing, politics, people usually get fixed in with that and it's, they're successful personally with that um, and it works for them personally. I'd say it's more dangerous for an organization to ever fix something. Right, especially um, you know nowadays. Like I've seen like what 50 things about AI in the last 10 minutes. You know, right, and so if you have a fixed mindset that says I'm not going to use AI, well look out. Right, that, that's probably going to come back and bite me. So does that mean I think every company should go out and full board adopt AI? No, that's not what I'm saying at all. But you you need to be um, you need to be current. Right, so. That's why challenging, challenging assumptions is so important, right? One thing I didn't say is it's not necessarily a one and done. So you may challenge an assumption today and say, I think it's valid. But what about next year? Is it still going to be valid then, right? Or the year after that? So uh, that reminds me, there was, there was a quote that I didn't put in, but it said something like this, that uh, uh, if you haven't changed in a year, be careful. If you haven't changed in five years, it's dangerous. If you haven't changed in 10 years, throw out everything and start over. Right? So you do have to stay current. But, but I do agree with you. So there are some things that uh, you, you might want to fix on. So I guess an example I would be is, uh, is um, you know, some of the soft skills, right? So I would say you want to fix on treating your people properly, right? <laughs> that you should have a fixed mindset on that, right? Now, how do you do that may evolve over time, but I really don't think that's something you should ever throw out. So, yeah. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Thank you for, for your presentation. So, just a quick question. Have you seen these mindset changing methodology applied 
only in the organization. So have you also seen that when you're working with your, uh, the companies, that it's also useful in engage with customers or with business partners, you know, in, in a wider scope rather than just as an organization. I, I don't see why it couldn't be, right? So I don't have a specific example off the top of my head that I can give you, but I don't see why it wouldn't work, right? Because um, the, while, while this pre change process I was talking about was more of like an organizational and operational type thing, I, I'm sure that you could apply that to any type of change you want. So, um, yeah, I don't see why not. Anyone else? Thank you. The offer to come see me in a few minutes still holds true. Thank you.